Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, my name is Patrick Rosati, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on land. The land on which we gather is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity to learn, work, and play here. Um, I also want to bring your attention to a couple of other events that are happening in the area quickly. Um, one is a play by Savage Society called White Noise. It's happening April 19th to May 8th here in Vancouver, Canada. It's at the Fire Hall Arts Center. Um, another one is the First Nations Talking Stick Festival. Again, here in Vancouver, Canada. It's at Roundhouse Community Arts and Recreation Center, February 18th to the 29th. Um, and then here on uh, University of British Columbia's campus, we are lucky enough to have the Museum of Anthropology uh, up on the north end of campus. And if you've not made your way out to campus before um, or haven't visited the Mun Museum of Anthropology, there's actually an amazing exhibit going on right now. Um, it's in a different light. Um, it presents more than 110 historical indigenous artworks and marks the return of many important works to British Columbia. Um, these objects are amazing artistic achievements, yet they also transcend the idea of art or artifact. Um, and that is, I've, I've been there twice. I've been to this exhibit twice. It really is worth taking a trip 10, 10 minutes north on campus to see it if you haven't. Um, and that runs through this summer, through summer 2020. So please do see that if you haven't. Um, I'd like to introduce Justine Garrett. Thanks so much, Patrick. And um, <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Um, we are grateful to HowlRound for helping us with our live stream today. So hello to everyone tuning in uh, that way as well. Um, I'd just like to give a brief introduction of Toaster Lab and um, why we're here, what we're doing. And uh, I'd like to say uh, Toaster Lab is a producer of mixed reality. We collapse space and time to produce original narratives. Um, I'm one third of Toaster Lab. Um, I'm joined by my partner, Ian Garrett, who will come up here in a moment, and Andrew Semprey, who's uh, actually going to be joining us from Switzerland in a few minutes. So Toaster Lab combines expertise in storytelling and in um, original media design and programming to produce original work and stories for our partners. And one uh, main element ties our work together. It's a sense of, it's a sense of the projector not advancing. No, no. Okay, it's in placed immersed media. <clears throat> Toaster Lab's signature focus is on emplaced media experiences and our apps guide users to specific locations to provide them with a window to another point in time or another reality. Uh, these images are from Transmission, which premiered as part of the Future Play Festival at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the Future of Storytelling Festival in New York. Um, basically, as you all probably really well know, two events line up together to provide different experiences that bring different types of understanding uh, to spaces. And this augmented reality uh, ties two points in time to one experience. And <clears throat> One project we were really excited about doing was in uh, Toronto's Parkway Forest Park. This was a really special project that we did with the Toronto Arts Council, and we worked with the local community who live around the park, uh, which is like a giant courtyard amongst many different apartment buildings to create VR stories that told stories about that community. Um, we did a VR workshop for our youth and they were definitely not easy on our 360 cameras. We got some amazing shots here, um, and they were highly enthusiastic about telling stories that were important to them, and they quickly adapted to staging and shooting in 360. At the end of the two weekend workshop with youth, we held a pop-up VR cinema in the park where parents and friends and family members got to experience the movies that the students had created. Um, and they were very excited to be hosts and tell their stories. And then at the end of the summer, we did a mobile application launch, which emplaced the students' stories within the park at Parkway Forest. And my partner Ian's gonna tell, talk to you a little bit about one of our uh, next projects, Groundworks. So I accidentally turned off. All right, 
so Groundworks is a project that we, uh, we've been working on sort of continuously for a couple of years in Northern California. Uh, it uh, combines a, a sense of restoring land, uh, working with a number of indigenous uh, collaborators in Northern California. Um, uh, Groundworks uh, combines elements of traditional knowledge. Uh, so we have one of our core collaborators uh, here on the right hand side, Ross Kadi, uh, with his cousin Paul, uh, and in their traditional regalia, but also is working, uh, Ross works as a youth, uh, uh, with lots of youth across a number of different tribes of which he is uh, affiliated with. Uh, and we were combining that with his current practice where he actually tours as a musician and hip hop artist uh, who's touring uh, as one of the leaders of audio pharmacy. And so he's been combining all of these things together and a number of the collaborators that we've been working with there have also been doing, uh, have uh, also been looking at their contemporary practice through uh, this indigenous lens with the idea of looking at issues of food security, water rights, um, uh, cultural transmission, et cetera. So we, uh, came, uh, we joined up, partnered up on this, around this idea of around uh, location-based storytelling. Uh, so we've been creating uh, 360 immersive audio and now working on some uh, more specifically AR projects with a number of the partners uh, that are around the Bay Area. Similarly to Parkway Forest, we've been using what Andrew will explain in a little bit, uh, and so the basis for a lot of how we control these things through the what we call the map tool. So we've been working with emplaced mixed reality where we've been creating uh, content, uh, immersive content that then is uh, located in space. And so you can see a little bit of the map tool that we work with here and some of the 360 that came out of a live performance that went along with this, which sort of gets us to uh, this idea of where we're working um, in this combined space between mixed reality and live performance. So in, in this project specifically, uh, it culminated in a live sense after doing a year of work um, with a number of different collaborators from different communities, um, sort of in a, about a 100 mile radius of the San Francisco Bay Area with on the first official Indigenous Peoples Day for the city of San Francisco, uh, where there has on that day, which had previously been designated as Columbus Day, had been a sunrise ceremony on Alcatraz, which is partially preserved for, uh, for its use as a ceremony spite, uh, a site. Um, had a live performance that culminated at the end of the sunrise ceremony with uh, Dancing Earth, which is uh, a, a multi-community multi indigenous dance group uh, that had created a site-specific dance work and through whom we were uh, working through a number of these different partnerships. So you can see a little bit here with this idea of over the course of creating uh, now totaling about three dozen different experiences that you could be guided around uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, or just Northern California, because uh, you got pretty far from the Bay, uh, with these different issues to combining uh, combine these topics. Uh, they also went and turned a lot of the thinking that came out of this collaboration into another project in the Southwest, based around Phoenix and Santa Fe, uh, where they're sort of co-located with a number of different communities there to create a piece called uh, Between Underground and Sky World. Uh, and we have created an experience which later today we'll be able to share some of the, the content that came out of that that's available uh, to, to easily access on mobile devices uh, that we were able to share that along with the show. So we're right now working on creating uh, a combination of the emplaced app using what, what we've done before with creating this content with something that ties directly into the performance itself so that when people uh, congregate around coming to one of their performances, like here you can see in the lobby, that there is also a mixed reality experience that allows somebody to interact with that content uh, that was done in specific places which might otherwise be harder to get to. And a couple of the other projects that, that we focused that worked on this, we were, uh, did a project in Kansas City with choreographer who's located between uh, Kansas City and Toronto called Public Squared, uh, which took a place along the Kansas City streetcar line, uh, having three site-specific dance pieces that happened and then creating companion VR films that went with them uh, that uh, one would be able to access through a mobile app. Uh, and mobile web app specifically. One of the things that we're dealing with with a number of these uh, projects is also around access. 
So trying to make things that are usable on the devices that people already have, as opposed to trying to make things for the most advanced devices um, in a number of these different projects. So about interoperability in that regard. Uh, another uh, of our ongoing projects has been uh, Trailoff, which is, uh, did you want to talk a little bit about Trailoff? Sure, yeah, about you've been involved in the narrative more yeah, than I have. So Trailoff is a transmedial walking performance, you know, that sort of normal thing, um, that's in collaboration with Swim Pony Performing Arts in Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania Environmental Council. And the focus of this is creating original audio dramas that are emplaced in trails around the Philadelphia circuit network. Um, Central to the project are 10 original audio stories and uh, that are inspired by the trails and line up with them in a triggered uh, way. And here you can see my ponytail, um, it's a braid today, uh, during one of our three development workshops on site in Philadelphia, which has been really rewarding, and uh, a preview of the app. Um, and then each trail, as I said, will fit your feet feature an original drama that unfolds over roughly a two mile route. Um, and it's, they're written by local authors who demonstrate rigorous artistic practice and also a connection to the communities that they're writing about. Um, this is writer Erin McMillan at one of the workshops for writers along with the bio of Afak Mahmoud. Um, and we're very excited that this project will be launching in June of 2020 in Philadelphia. Um, so audiences are going to experience these intimate journeys through an original app produced by Toaster Lab. And um, each author is going to have the opportunity to select where the gates would trigger the next element of their story. So we're working really closely with them to come up with these really elaborate, essentially triggering spreadsheets that show um, where and how long each element of the story will unfold. And there's other elements to add to that yeah. too in that we're also working with other, uh, because there's a lot of data that comes into somebody's mobile device, that there are also things that are triggered based off of current weather conditions or time of year that they go. So How fast beyond, people are moving. Yeah. yeah. So moving a little bit beyond the GPS triggered sound lock to also do something that's more dynamic and reactive to the way that people are moving through space. We hope it works. <laughs> So yeah, we have uh, a few different projects to update on. Part of the purpose of these symposia uh, and the Digital Strategy Fund grant that we've been working under has been to share out, as we've been partnering with companies, the type of development that's been happening uh, across um, uh, different ways of interacting with different types of mixed reality technology. A lot of our core work as Toaster Lab coming into this had been around uh, recorded content that was matched and in place, like matched with place, uh, but we've been expanding that as we've been uh, partnering with a number of different projects as well. Yeah. So this is sort of our point to sort of update um, in the sequence of those. Yeah, and the today's focus really, as you may have known, is about uh, ways of working within mixed reality and performance we're also going to talk a lot about mistakes that people have made and things that don't go so well. Um, so please feel free to ask questions and interact with folks as they're presenting. Um, and we're going to hope to give you some more information about either starting uh, to work in this way on your own or um, you know, sharing successes that you have as well. Yeah, and I'll point out that we've uh, we've been lucky to have the generous support of the Canada Council through this Digital Strategy Fund. It is a fund that is still, it's sort of winding down in this current uh, the strategic period, but it is still available, that's out there, and uh, one of the things that's nice about it, one of the, uh, there, there are challenges about it, but one of the things that's really nice about it is that it is, uh, failure is an option in here. So there's a number of projects that people have been attempting to do things and they don't know exactly what they're going to make. So as opposed to a number of different uh, creation grants that you might approach, um, if you're looking at something that you also just don't know how to do, um, it's a good uh, approach. Uh, thing to do. They uh, have very large grants that I think that we might be out of cycle with those, but if you're going for the $50,000 and under, which is not nothing, um, that uh, those have an ongoing uh, rolling application in there. Yeah. So we'll plug in them there. Yeah. But so some of the projects that we've uh, been working on, uh, we've been working with DLT Experience in Toronto on a project called uh, The Stranger 2.0. Actually, it's completed in the fall. Um, we've been doing, over the course of the last year, just sort of out of interest, uh, DLT Experience is known for creating uh, uh, immersive, live, site-specific performances for small audiences, typically averaging less than two. 
Um, so sometimes there's more than one person involved, but not very frequently. Uh, so they're hard to scale, too. So we've been having this conversation about uh, VR. So we've been playing a lot with VR cameras. This is Daniele Bartolini, who's the artistic director of DLT Experience, um, with uh, one of the, the Views camera that we were doing some workshops in, in the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. In the Italian Cultural Center. It yes. It's wonderful. So he's been in residence at the Columbus Center in Toronto. Um, one of the projects that came out of this, one of the more notable projects that DLT has done in Toronto over the last few years has been called The Stranger, which takes uh, one individual at a time through various downtown locations of performance to lead them through a different experience of what it's like to be someone landing in a city for the first time, sort of focused on the immigrant mm -hmm. experience. In The Stranger 2.0, the idea was to allow more people so that you went as pairs and that there were two different tracks that you could follow mm -hmm. around the urban space around the Columbus Circle. Uh, or center, rather. It was good. <laughs> so it worked out really well. Um, what we ended up contributing to this was how can you integrate something that's filmically VR to trans somebody, uh, transport somebody out of these experiences to create something in contrast. So there's two tracks above and below. Um, we created two short VR films that you would interact with in uh, over the course of um, uh, your tracks about four minutes long that were inserted into the narrative structure of both of those of those directions. So you'd, you'd come into those, mm -hmm. and there's sort of a, a still from the VR here. One, the above being a much more happy, joyous one. There's a lot of playing with the baby, and then below, um, darker. The baby's fine. The, <laughs> the baby's fine, fine. <laughs> but it is a little bit of a darker narrative yeah. um, that you're following with that. Um, one of the projects that we were able to talk a little bit about in our previous symposium in November was the Albion uh, Library VR project. That's fun. Yeah, we did this in partnership with Kitchen Band Theater, which is also in uh, Toronto. Uh, they had received funding. There's a program that the city funds around artists in the library. And we worked with them uh, to, similarly to Parkway, mm -hmm. work with community members and different community groups, uh, different people who intersect in this public space. Um, we're like, just as an aside, we're fans of libraries as they're like the last remaining uh, like business like establishment that has a space where you're not expected to buy something. So like how people use this space. So um, there was some narrative work in here. We combined it with some uh, uh, narrative work combining looking at the history of what that site was. You can see that in the lower uh, left-hand corner here where we were... Um, also have it making companion films that we go between that we're looking at local park space mm -hmm. uh, to look at what the natural landscape would have been like before that. Uh, there were community dance groups. This is Navron Dance uh, that's up in North Etobicoke. Um, Elder Philip Cote, uh, introduced the area from an indigenous perspective. And then we also had some fun. Uh, Carolina, who is uh, the, our contact person, is the branch manager. Um, we did one piece where we just strapped a 360 camera onto a book that was being returned. So it went through the book drop, and then you would get reshelved yeah. into things. And could, it could go through that, that, that process. Uh, the other projects that we've been working on, there's been uh, two others that we've been able to sort of complete in this time. One has been uh, just actually partnering with a new festival that's in Southern Oregon called Live Culture Coast. Uh, because they're looking at a decentralized, uh, it goes up and down uh, the coastal areas. Uh, we uh, had met each other, uh, myself and Amber Peoples, who is the artistic director of this new festival, uh, had met and talked about what the infrastructure of this has been like. So the purpose of this project was really to have people on site to talk about how uh, emplacement and emplaced artwork um, would work with this festival. It's a combination of agriculture and arts festival. It's culture, like culture, food, and culture. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it there is. were like various stands going for it, and then there would be uh, installations at uh, in uh, um, uh, at on farms. Yeah. Uh, and so guiding people through the space is a challenge there, uh, based off of other festivals that had happened before. And a project that we're working on currently is a production of so moving into the actual back into the theater. Because uh, we've been doing a lot of things outside, a lot of it because of the emplacement uh, and the ubiquity of GPS. So part of it's been convenient. Um, and working in various types of public spaces to talk about what types of stories we exist in there. We spend a lot of time taking immersive audio recording and 360 cameras into like very hot forests. 
<laughs> yes. It's it's like it's like if anybody's familiar with geocaching, it's not entirely unlike that, but with media. And the best way that I've heard that described is using a system of multi-billion dollar satellites to find junk in the woods. So we make the junk that you put into the woods. Uh, we have, uh, we are also working on projects that are coming into theatrical spaces as well. Uh, so this is a project that we've been working on. We have been working uh, with motion capture just sort of in various projects that we've been working before. This is our, at the time, three-year-old son um, testing out uh, an older organic motion stage that we had. I also teach at York. And so we were doing some experiments here. Um, a lot of this technology, interestingly, has become much more accessible. So on this production, um, we've been uh, using a much smaller area to do digitization. So this is the lighting designer, Ello, uh, for this production, um, standing in to do some lighting tests for some work we were doing with the actors in green screen uh, for various parts of the video design that end up there. But then also creating these augmented reality characters. So some of the characters are, related, uh, are created through these uh, three-dimensional um, puppets uh, that we're creating. The main one of which, um, and you may never look at me the same again after this, is that we've been <laughs> using facial motion capture uh, to animate one of the characters in sort of a Wizard of Oz sort of look. We've got the chroma back here for the purpose of, of taking that out later on when we put it on, on the stage. Uh, but one of the characters, um, we've gone through an entire motion capture um, a process of capturing the performer's face and uh, altering that. Um, and all of this using the, uh, a recent iPhone that has the depth sensor on the front of it. So we've gone from replacing the full stage that we were working with before to, um, uh, to something that um, we always have uh, with us in our pockets. And that's been a, a period of, of five years. It's not actually puppeteering me talking right now. Um, and then uh, the last project that we'll mention as sort of our update is that we've just gotten a second round of funding to work on a new version of Parkway, which will allow us to uh, expand elements of it to bring in the storytelling element that we've been doing down in Philadelphia and bring that back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and also to start looking at other ways of uh, integrating other types of AR content that are community driven uh, as well. So this will be another app that we'll build that will be yeah. uh, a dedicated app. And, and still use the same map tool, which itself creates a web app and what it's, what it's doing. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, um, but I'm going to try to hang out and lurk a bit on the feed. And I'm always excited to, to be there and to see another room full of awesome people doing cool work. Um, I'm also at the tail end of what I hope is the end of a kind of cold bronchitis thing. So I apologize for my voice. And if I start coughing, I might mute. But I'm not going to talk that long, so it should be OK. Um, Ian asked me to give a really quick update from uh, software land. Um, about two months ago at the previous, um, at the previous symposium, uh, we talked a little bit about this tool that we're working on called the map tool. It's not an exciting name, but it's stuck, stuck so far. Uh, it's basically a kind of Swiss army knife for making locative based um, projects. So at its, at its very bare bones, what you can imagine is essentially just uh, a way to affiliate information and media with a location on a map. That, the, that then can subsequently be used by whatever you like, by a mobile app, by a web-based app, um, or by itself, because it's sort of the authoring tool itself also can display this information. So in some cases, we've used it as the actual uh, presentation layer. In any case, um, what we're trying to do strategically and in the context of this grant is to kind of drive uh, software development uh, of a multi-purpose tool, but using specific projects as the drivers. And this is pretty neat, but it's a balancing act trying to keep an eye on the specific requirements of a project, uh, which are often more present and more pressing, um, or seem to be, than kind of making the piece, the, the piece general purpose. So this is a really normal thing that happens, but because of that, uh, we, we now have, I think, um, close to a dozen projects running on top of the software platform, which is awesome. Um, but all of them have like, you know, maybe slightly different approach. So until about two months ago, they were running the same code, but with a little bit of a tweak. So this is sort of beta mode. Um, and over the last two months, I've uh, put a large effort into streamlining that and making sure everything is on an exactly the same code base with only a configuration file change. So this is not super exciting to show you. Um, this is very nerdy update, but it's been a lot of work and I'm really excited to say that we're done with that. So now every single one of our projects is on a single shared code base, which makes my life a lot easier and makes maintenance going forward a lot easier as well. Um, so last two points with regards to that one is that the goal of that also is to try to get this project open source. It is in fact open source, but as I mentioned at the last symposium, 
There's a difference between just publishing code in public, which is fine, but that's not really an open source project, right? An open source project is one that can be, can and is used by other people. And in order for that to happen, the code should be maintained and structured in such a way that other people can actually use it. So that's been another part of this big two month push is that I'm really driving us towards a V1 release of this and so getting out of beta that works in Andrew's head and into something that other people can actually use. And I'm really excited. We're not quite there. We're very, very close to having a V1 release of this code base, which is great. Um, and all of that, of course, is in the context lately of the trail off project. So we've also been doing a lot of work on infrastructure for figuring out ways to distribute large amounts of media uh, in a way that is cost effective. Um, so trying to figure out how we can host uh, several gigabyte files that represent this walking tour and get them to people's phones, but without um, paying through the nose for large amounts of uh, data and, st and streaming services. Um, which has been an interesting challenge, but I also am pretty excited about the solution that we've come up with there. So that is an update from engineering land. Thank you. Um, so that's our, that's our toaster lab update. Yeah. That's what we've been up I to. Not hear your audio, oh. so if there are questions. Uh, that is, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you now. Thank you. Um, that's an update from toaster lab land. Uh, giving you a sort of the grounding for the context of why we're bringing these, uh, these convenings together so that we're able to give an update on all of the different strands of work that we've been doing um, and also then host these conversations around people who are also doing interesting work for it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's in this sort of hybrid area, there's not necessarily a huge amount of uh, direction. There's a lot of overlapping and people coming at it from different, whether or not they're coming from a narrative end, whether or not they've been working in uh, digital media and types of distribution or immersive uh, content for a while or whether or not they're coming from it from a theater and performance end of things, um, trying to gather everybody together. Um, we have a moment for another, uh, for a question or two if there are here. Otherwise, uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. So the question was, um, does our map tool have directionality in terms of orienting audience members to performance yeah, sites? Cardinal, I guess you cardinal. cardinal directions. Yeah. Um, Andrew, you can talk more technical on that. That has also been part of the narrative, especially within story trails, because we trail, uh, trail off. Sorry, it's old name with story trails. Yeah. Uh, with trail with the trail off project. Uh, it, it, like coming at that from a few different, that specific issue from a few different directions uh, because some of those are very linear and some of them that line is obvious, but many of them are non-linear and many of them are non-obvious. So how do you get all three of the uh, production elements, the technical elements and the narrative elements to line up together and combine in the, in the app? Andrew, could you comment a little bit more specifically about what that means in terms of what, how the map tool works? Yeah, I can. Um, so the okay. So sorry for the for the splitting of hairs here, but it's actually necessary to explain. So the thing that we're calling the map tool is basically the authoring and the infrastructure for hosting information about the experience. It's not the experience itself. So in that respect, you can put any information you like, including orientation information, into that tool. It will host it. It will have it available. So that's a thing. But there's a, there's a more important part of that question, which is, I think, what you actually want to accomplish, which is like understanding uh, where a person is actually standing, uh, how they're oriented, and then feeding them the media uh, for that. So that's less about the map tool and more about the actual thing that you're using for the experience. In this case, it would probably be, I'm assuming, a, a phone app. So the, 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 thing, the thing that understands the orientation is going to be the device, not the database, if that makes sense. Um, so then the challenge there, as Ian mentioned this in the introduction, that we've been late, lately working a lot on the idea of creating experiences that are uh, low threshold. So the thought is that anyone who has a mobile device can access our experiences. So because of that, 
we've been deliberately limiting ourselves in, in what we can access on the devices. So the latest iPhone, for example, actually can handle the orientation information relatively well, um, but not so much say, an early Android device. So we haven't put a lot of work into that specifically because of that, because we haven't had a project that has articulated a hardware device that has made this sufficiently easy for us to do. So that's where I would draw the line. Sorry, again, this is a bit of a technical thing, but I think that basically if we were to do an orientation-based project, seriously, I would first say, what set of devices are we using? Pick that, and we'd have to build up for that because there really, to be completely blunt, there is no hope for coming up with a solution that will work for all possible devices throughout history, right? We have to draw a line somewhere. And that's one of those things that's, that's, that's highly device oriented and relatively new. It's really cool, but not everybody has it. So um, yeah, that's a start there. Um, yeah, I'll stop. Any other questions? Does that help, Ian? Right over there. Um, I'm just curious about yes. what mistakes you guys have made. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I start? Yeah, yeah, there's so lots cathartic. of them. cathartic. I love answering yeah. that question. So. Um, the, we had our first project was a 30 plus site uh, specific GPS triggered app in Edinburgh where we did not live. And so uh, it was extremely ambitious and extremely expensive. And we learned it was so painful. Like it really was not, it did not, was not critically well received because it was extremely complicated to experience. But we began working on, on that in 2015 and then uh, launched it in 2017 at, at the French Festival and at the uh, Future of Storytelling. But we learned so much from that in terms of like the number of mistakes we had the opportunity to make. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's really laid the, the that colossal, it wasn't a colossal failure. I won't say it that way. It was a lot of work. And there were some amazing parts of it too. But all the things we did wrong in there were, were really valuable. Like we had a stage show portion of it that we uh, put at the, the middle of the story. So you would have had to have experienced a certain number of GPS triggered things uh, at the Edinburgh Fridge Festival. It should have been the beginning or the, you know, it's just simple stuff like that. Yeah, there is, uh, throughout a number of things, that each of them has been sort of highlighting like what, uh, where we need to go next. So there have been the the technical issues that we've been able to yeah. solve with each of them because we're trying to do something new or because there's something new that we want to do with a, uh, with a particular device uh, or a new feature that becomes available or more accessible to more people. Yeah. But I think more so, and especially looking back at that, uh, specifically at, at Transmission, there are things that coming from... So just as an example, even a year before that, when we were just trying to describe what exactly we were trying to do, it would take a page or two whenever we're writing a narrative, writing a proposal as to what exactly we're going to do. And then in summer of 2016, Pokemon Go was released. And all of a sudden, we could have a one-sentence description of, because uh, the, the show that we were yeah. working on was based off of uh, uh, um, communication with, uh, like, extraterrestrial communication. So we're like, it's Pokemon Go meets Arrival. And people would get it like that. So it's like learning what the limits are to what we're doing and yeah. having people come at it from the technology mm -hmm. side, from the immersive site specific of it. Like there were people who had been, who have long theater careers, long techno technology careers, people who had been part of like third rail projects as a notable like immersive company and been part of those shows for long periods of time. Yeah. That with all of those different things, there was still a lot to figure out in, in each of those in, in sort of the speed that we needed to work. Um, so it ended up highlighting a lot of those. We'll be able to talk much more uh, about failures throughout the day. We can highlight a lot of things. It's a very <laughs> long list of things, which is, again, why, why being in the position of being able to go through this atelier project of throwing things at different questions and not always, like, a lot of the projects that we're doing are going to production. Yeah. But a lot of them are also things that are experiments to see, like, what if we added this on to something that was already happening yeah. Um, yeah. as well. I'm gonna... Ha, 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 ha.